And so without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Justin Waite from Hodges University. Um, Justin, I, I love your bio, thank you. Uh, Justin goes on rants about copyright law, sometimes even in publications. Otherwise, he spends his time working on local history, academic publishing promotion, and hanging out with a roommate bunny named Blue. It's so cool. Too bad you don't have a picture. Uh, so I thought about it. <laughs> All right, so without further ado, um, Justin. All right, so just as some um, ways of introduction, thank you for coming today. Um, the slides, you can see the link are available here on the first slide. Many of the images are linked. So as we go through, this is going to be my handout uh, along with the notes that I'm going to be reading off of. Uh, I will be reading some of the slides out for accessibility reasons. Um, and also, I, I realized the description of the talk was very much academic. Um, but the first half of the talk is going to talk about more popular issues. And then the second half will tie those into how they affect us in academia and in librarianship. Uh, so don't leave when I start talking about musicians and YouTube. I promise that they're mentioned for a reason. Okay. So where we are now. If you want to change how copyright is used, you change the law, right? We all remember this from Schoolhouse Rock. However, if you upload more than 10 seconds of that Schoolhouse Rock video to YouTube, this is what you might get. Now, there's nothing that says fair use is 10 seconds or less, but for its own purposes, YouTube has decided that this is a good way to automatically take down piracy, and for the most part, it probably works. However, look at this photo from uh, a video of the Berkman Klein on uh, copyright year in your review, review 2016. This was a speech given by an expert in intellectual property. I think the content used was fair use. But YouTube's bot only sees a match between protected content and more than 10 seconds, so boom, the talk goes down. This stifles creative reuse on a platform, YouTube, that is rightly renowned for its ability to turn people into creators. They even call their major performers content creators. Peter S. Minnell is not a copyright noob, the person who was giving the speech and whose speech was recorded and ended up on YouTube. And as you can see below, the video seems to be up now. They must have contested the takedown. Here you can see uh, Dr. Minnell's CV. Uh, quite interesting stuff. I was actually reading some of his papers when I was putting slides together. I kept getting distracted. Uh, there's quite a lot of interesting stuff there. So if this is your sort of thing, I definitely recommend reading more. So here's some other Google takedowns you might have seen. Uh, these are also done by Content ID. Remember that YouTube is owned by Google, so they both use the same Content ID system, which costs something like $60 million to, to develop. You'll see these at the bottom of your Google search results, and it'll say you can go to lumendatabase.org to see the DMCA complaints and why they were taken down. So fair use and technocratic lawmaking. So I'm going to show a quick video clip. I'm glad you asked that question, Gooba. The sewers on Main Street is a subject very close to all of us. And I say if the people want new sewers, they shall have them. The will of the people. That shall be my beacon to shine forever in the darkness of political ignorance. Well, as county clerk, uh, the sewer situation is an area that is not unfamiliar to me. I have some figures here on the cost of repairing our old one. Now, if we were to concentrate on the 200-foot run between 1st and 3rd Streets, we could completely repair this line, uh, assuming that the plumbing uh, wage cost remains at a constant. Why should anyone vote for me when you have a man like Howard Sprague running? And I wholeheartedly urge you to cast your vote for Howard Sprague. <laughs> okay, so democracy triumphs again. Um, while this is a commentary on the difference uh, between democratic and bureaucratic rule, uh, the idea is similar. And the idea is that to manage a large process or an organization, it requires a large bureaucracy, something you might be familiar with in the work of Max Weber. Uh, this clip was what came to mind when I was thinking about technocratic rulemaking. It's the rules that these non-government platforms make to comply with government rules to then prevent themselves from liability. Uh, that for me, I wanted to use that clip because it says in under a minute what Max Weber took entirely too long to say himself. And if you want to read more about that, you could read, rather than Max Weber, maybe read Kafka's 
the castle and you get this, the idea of what the bureaucracy is supposed to look like in this idea. So however, having used this clip, copyright and fair use allows me to do that. Here are things I know how to do. I know how to find a hosted episode I need on a pirated website. I know how to make a clip that would be fair use and short enough that YouTube wouldn't use content ID to take it down. And I can use that clip. And I note that I might have cheated here because that video was unlisted and might have kept it from being picked up, but it has been in the system over a month to see if Content ID would catch it anyway. Things I don't know how to do. Contact the exact people I would need to get a license to use under 10 seconds of a clip for this show, because even if I did get a license, Content ID doesn't know that. I can pay those people for that use if necessary. But why should I pay for fair use, especially in a digital age? Well, the main reason for that is because breaking encryption, which almost everything is encrypted over the internet, is potentially against the law. This was an earlier XKCD comic about DRM, uh, digital rights management locked uh, music. And this was a time when people were buying things from iTunes and then their discs would, their music collections would go missing uh, because the rights holder changed their mind and you had bought it, now you don't have it. it. Turns out you'd never bought it, you had leased it. And so the, it comes to the only sensible conclusion. If you want a collection you can count on, pirate it. You'll be a criminal either way if you tried to make your own backup. So DRM Locked Media, this was a story that came out of Canada as they were recently going, uh, going over their anti-circumvention provisions. Um, they're arguing that they were too narrow. And here's a quote, we think it would have prevented legitimate and legal uses of copyrighted materials, said David Robinson, Associate Executive Director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. He added that such a law would make it illegal, if not impossible, to make legitimate copies of software. And I should add in, this week, a similar law has been passed in Australia, which uh, will allow teachers and cultural institutions uh, to have something akin to fair use. Fair use is an American doctrine and it had to be imported into their law. So what is the Netflix for consumer licensing for these clips? You might think of a couple, uh, but are they really as well known as say YouTube, Netflix, Amazon, or others? And why don't these exist? Lots of people could uh, like to remix aspects of copyrighted material without breaking copyright. Kanye West could have probably used a company like that. Yet, Kanye West can probably hire people or companies needed to find the content they need in an efficient and cost-effective manner. They can find a company that buys up rights to shows, music, whatever, and then make licenses of various sizes. That leaves us with two problems of complying with copyright in a way that will allow the current creativity, which is mostly infringing, to continue without infringing on copyright. Licensing does not exist on any general consumer scale. So for example, if you want to use a clip from Disney, this is the website you're taken to. I'm just gonna read one Q&A. Question, do you have a comprehensive list of the assets that are available for licensing? Answer, unfortunately, we do not have a comprehensive list of our uh, productions that we can provide to the general public. Should this licensing uh, of net, this Netflix of licensing clips exist? And this is uh, the book, one of the books that's inspiring this talk, The End of Ownership, talks about the issue in detail, really goes into the history of court decisions on digital copying and fair use. But why should I pay for anything? for something that is covered by fair use. If I can find a licensed version online and set up my screen capture, is that any different than waiting for it to run on TV and use a VCR? Should I buy a DVD set of the Andy Griffith Show to get this clip and then make fair use of it? Should I wait till it comes on TV and use software to record it to my computer? Should I buy it digitally somewhere and then use screen capture software to get the clip I'm using? Should I crack the protection software on the DVD so I can carve up the episode the way I need it? So I'm going to do a quick poll. I'm going to pull up the chat. Uh, under DMCA, does screen capture count as circumvention of encryption? A, yes, B, no, C, don't know. Yes, 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 don't know. 
Yes, yes with the question mark. No, I don't know, don't know, don't know, yes. Okay. So a lot more of the right answer than I thought because the answer is maybe. Uh, the anti-circumvention provisions make that illegal to, uh, particularly if you are making a screencast of something, it might be infringing, it might be anti-circumvention, and that's because copyright law has gray areas. This is generally for the good. I'm not complaining about gray areas because it allows people to protect themselves from liability. Even more confusing, though, is that automated takedowns have occurred against license use because Content ID doesn't know when the music has been licensed. So there was a major embarrassment in this when Viacom sued YouTube, and during the course of litigation, it was discovered that many of the infringing items it charged YouTube over were uploaded by Viacom itself. So why is this all necessary to go over? Copyright is being treated by corporations as a type of property law. So this is a little more complicated, but it is a belief that emerging that copyright is akin to a property right. The assumption falls apart the moment one realizes that property laws do not expire after a certain amount of time, even though the owner may. I'm just gonna have to read this, I'm sorry for the long text. In most nations, the authorized sale of a copy by the copyright author ends the rights of the copyright owner to control the further sale or distribution of that particular copy. So the purchaser of that copy may later sell or otherwise transfer the copy to others without permission. This is known variously as the first sale doctrine and as the doctrine of exhaustion, the exhaustion of the right of distribution. Uh, thus, it's common practice for various vendors to engage in the sale of used books and recordings, whether purchased back from consumers or from other vendors that bought copies that they were unable to sell. This is the doctrine that allows libraries to exist. Exhaustion means property rights will be prioritized over the copyright holder's interests, making a somewhat clearer distinction between the two as to where a person's copyrights end and a person's property rights begin. So a somewhat indirect retort uh, to this, fair use is not an exemption to copyright. Copyright is the exemption to the free exchange of ideas. It is a monopoly granted uh, over the control of your ideas. It is not something that comes out of naturally obtained rights. And if you want to click uh, that link that will take you to a court case from the uh, 1800s that goes over the distinction of naturally obtained rights. Uh, this is when naturally obtained rights were essentially struck, stricken from uh, American and British law and common law, that these were not recognized in the, in the way that they were on the continent. Making a copy at zero cost is in no way an infringement on a person's property rights. The only universe in which it makes sense is in copy rights, where the right to make a copy is wrong because it infringes on the author's moral rights, uh, something that many copyright holders and advocates do not understand if we can judge from the responses to the Judicial Committee's publication uh, of input on moving the Copyright Office out of the Library of Congress. And I'm going to read one. Our founding fathers specifically protected copyright as a fundamental natural property right in the text of the Constitution. This is where the choir of angels sing. And today, copyright-related industries, particularly creative industries, dominate the globe, contributing well over one trillion to US GDP and account for an estimated 5.5 million jobs. And they have some name as freedom and individual or something I didn't really pay attention. So there are lots of theories of copyright, and this is not really the time to get into them because then we start talking about what is ownership, what is copyright, where do those blur. But if you want to learn more, here is a Copyright X course from the Berkman Klein uh, Center for, uh, I think, online studies. It's, it's a whole course. The low cost of copying changes the economics of everything digital. So this is the main focus of the book, The Inevitable. The Inevitable talks about shifts in economics that come from technological changes. And one major change has been paying for peace of mind. Before we paid to get a copy of a CD or to get uh, access to uh, a subscription service or something like that. Now we see people who are set up on YouTube, they have a band on YouTube, they have a band on their own, on a CD Baby or wherever else, 
and people pay them and, and they don't have to. They can say a minimum of $1, but people are paying them. And what are they paying for? Well, they're paying for peace of mind. They want to reward the creator, not necessarily the publisher. They want to make sure they've got the newest official version. They don't want to get a, you know, a, a copied version that someone has tinkered with to pull a prank, which happened with the Toy Story 3 movie. And that's an interesting story. You can Google that. Uh, and to enable us to legally create, which is often driven by first learning how to create with illegally copied work. So we pay because we want to be able to go into a new realm of creation so that we don't have to worry about dealing with illegally copied work that we kind of honed our skills on. This is the case of everyone. Everyone who, who works in computing at some point says, yeah, I did pirate this software so I could learn it, that sort of thing. That goes all the way up to Bill Gates. So Patreon is an example of this. Patreon was created for, specifically for musicians and creates a model that takes all the traditional model that the DMCA and other copyright law has been focusing on protecting kind of pointless for the little guy. Uh, technologies that make it much easier for an individual or collective of small artists to deal with distribution, building a fan base, payments, income stream, promotion, all of those things that formerly required a large company. So is piracy actually an issue? We've got concerns about piracy versus innovation. There's a study you can read here from the Copia Institute. Um, not going to go into it, but essentially the licensing, it, it found that licensing reduces piracy, but enforcement doesn't. And enforcement in some cases can even drive down sales. Uh, some of this is also covered in the other two books mentioned, The Inevitable and um, The End of Ownership. So infringement goes down when there's an option at a fair market price. And this was something you might've heard of. Um, Orange is the new black. So hackers were able to get access to the 10 first episodes of the new Orange is the New Black season and basically held them ransom uh, for Netflix. And Netflix started talking to them, but then decided they weren't going to do anything. So the hackers released one episode, kind of like sending, you know, like a kidnapping victim, sending like a, like a finger in a box or something. Netflix didn't budge. They released the next 10 episodes uh, for the new season, and it really didn't do anything. People have Netflix for more than just one show, and uh, all it did was really release spoilers. So what we're going to talk about academia and education. See, only 20 minutes in, I'm already there. So problems with the way copyright law affects all users means that they're going to come to affect us as librarians and as academics and as educators. Particularly, it's the issue of licenses and how copyright and the end user license agreements, EULAs, affect both our daily interaction with software and materials, as well as our professional lives and the contracts we sign with vendors and the publishing agreements we sign with academic journals and even uh, our employers. And that was supposed to be the last one. So EULAs, software information, vendor contracts, publishing agreements. So I want you to check to see if in your contract with your employer, does it say anywhere that your employer technically owns the copyright on things you write on their equipment or on their time? And if they do, have you ever given the copyright to a publisher to publish something you wrote? Did you ever actually technically own that? Well, this is kind of an odd situation. So this is from the um, Association of American University Professors. Uh, generally, faculty scholarly work is not considered work for hire. It's been prevailing academic practice to treat the faculty member as a copyright owner of works that are created independently and at the faculty member's own initiative for traditional academic purposes. Despite this general practice and legal understanding, some colleges and universities still proclaim that even traditional academic works are works made for hire and that the institution is the owner, initial owner of the copyright. The most common standard employed by universities for claiming ownership of faculty works is the use of university resources, in quotes, or, quote, significant or substantial use of university resources, end quote. However, since there is no tradition of applying this standard, the process of defining it will be one of uncertainty for both parties. You might not be surprised to learn at this point that this apparent contradiction has not been resolved or even been brought to head in court. The gray areas continue to persist. I made this because I hate the term end user. 
because it emphasizes a model of passive consumption. But if you've been paying even a little bit of attention, there are lots of people reusing, remixing, and redistributing new content based on old. Sometimes they're getting away with it in terms of fair use, but sometimes they're also getting their videos taken down, and then they end up on internet forums asking, how can I get my YouTube channel back? How can I get my video back? And it's not like this is a new thing, but it has democratized the issue of having a much larger creative base. So another issue that uh, is going to affect us is stifling criticism using the Digital Millennial Copyright Act and its takedown provisions. So let's take a look at another interesting takedown notice from YouTube. Uh, I'm quoting from an article, you can read the slide. We just wrote about the Ninth Circuit's ridiculously problematic ruling claiming that an actress who appears in five seconds of a 13-minute Innocence of Muslims trailer has a copyright interest in her performance, allowing the court to order Google to remove all copies of the video, along with a highly questionable gag order. And this was the actual uh, takedown notice that Google put up for this video. And we strongly disagree with this copyright ruling and will fight it. Sorry about that. So Titan Note. Titan Note, if you might remember, was one of the big early companies uh, that, that really made it on crowdfunding. And it was supposed to be this amazing transcription device. And it nothing kept coming up. And it, there was a lot of problems with you know, getting people their money back. And they'd raised a lot of money. And it didn't seem like they were going to be able to deliver. So when people were writing about this, because crowdfunding was still quite new, uh, Titan Note started sending out false DMCAs to people who were writing critical articles about their project. Really, they were just explaining what had happened. But Titan Note was saying, no, you're using our copyrighted images, even though they're being used under fair use. But DMCA takedown notices tend to get the benefit of the doubt, especially as you consider that you can have a whole economy of bots that go around taking things down. Of course, they're going to be, uh, it's in a situation where takedown is the, gets the benefit of the doubt. Even more hilarious is that Warner Brothers, in its response to uh, some counter charges from uh, Hotfile, uh, who was the claimed infringer, seems to suggest that it's preposterous to think that it should have to actually check to make sure files are actually infringing, even as it appears to be making the argument that service providers, such as YouTube, should do exactly that. Uh, each one of these images is a link to a story where uh, DMCAs were used to stifle criticism uh, of one of these companies. I'm just leaving this up here for fun. I'm going to read more from the previous article. Uh, and yet we're regularly told that YouTube should be responsible for checking the content of every video uploaded. Among the other mistaken downloads were, a tech, were the text of a Harry Potter book, which may be infringing, but Warner only owns the copyright on the movies, not the books. So earlier, the, I'm quoting from another article, so earlier this year, uh, Jennifer Urban and Brianna Schofield from the University of California with Joe Karaganis of Columbia University found that more than 32% of DMCA takedown notices were either flawed or had characteristics which raised questions about their validity. This equates to more than 35 million notices. This somewhat agrees with Twitter's own data, indicating that around 33% of notices it receives are ineffective. WordPress found 60% of the DMCA takedown notices it receives as being ineffective. So WordPress, which is the largest host of personal and professional websites, their parent company said, essentially, we try. So here's some of the findings of the study. Uh, particularly was the very last two lines, the second and third studies revealed a surprisingly high percentages of notices of questionable validity, <clears throat> of questionable validity with mistakes made by both bots and humans. It's questioning whether or not to take down notices actually work for their intended topic. Earlier this week, you'll note June 14th on the title there, uh, there was a ruling in a German court that means even DMCA takedown notices have been made, have been taken down and made private so that no one can know when something was taken down, thus obfuscating possible instances of DMCA abuse. And you can learn more about 
takedown issues at takedownproject.org slash about. Sharing is not a crime. I'm going to show one more video. Hola, soy Diego Gómez, soy biólogo y hago investigación para salvar especies en peligro de extinción. Vivo en Costa Rica y coordino proyectos de investigación para salvar anfibios como las ranas y algunos felinos silvestres. Cerca del 2009 me encontraba estudiando biología en la Universidad del Quindío, una universidad de provincia de Colombia, donde el acceso al conocimiento y artículos científicos en general era bastante complicado. Esto nos entorpecía los procesos de investigación que queríamos iniciar y entonces solicitábamos a colegas nacionales e internacionales que nos compartieran estos recursos a través de Internet. Yo he compartido artículos por Internet. Sí, eventualmente como la mayoría de las personas lo hacen. Sí, ¿quién no lo ha hecho? Sí, usualmente. Sí, claro, constantemente. Claro, como muchos. Sí, yo he compartido en ocasiones artículos por Internet. El pasado 24 de mayo se dictó sentencia en el caso de Diego y lo absolvieron pero ahora la Fiscalía o la víctima pueden apelar. Por eso necesitamos de su apoyo, para enfrentar la apelación, pero también para buscar nuevos caminos jurídicos que nos permitan evitar que casos como el de Diego se repitan. So as you can see, uh, that was a case of a Colombian biology grad student who shared a master's thesis. And because of the trade laws between the United States and Colombia, Colombia has enacted a very harsh uh, penalty for copyright uh, infringement. And uh, although you might have heard, if you had been following his case, that he had been acquitted, um, in the United States that would make him free and clear, but this can be appealed uh, in Colombia. It's not an issue of double jeopardy for them. It's a procedural issue. Issue. But this can happen to us if you were reading the news this week. The uh, American Psychological Society decided to start filing DMCAs to protect publisher prints that were on preprint servers. Uh, filing DMCAs to protest, sorry, publisher prints that were on preprint servers, essentially taking them down. Here's what one author said in response to the news. I've always understood that we sign copyright on our articles over to the journals for free, which is in principle pretty egregious, especially since we actually pay fees to publish them and do service like peer reviewing for the journals for free, and ostensibly only retain particular limited rights to redistribute them. But this has never especially concerned me because I've never really seen them attempting to exercise the copyright against us. I think there has been a sort of quiet tolerance of us infringing the copyright to share our articles with each other, presumably because if they were to press the issue, it would highlight how ridiculous the situation is. So anyway, although I have for my whole career maintained a website full of my articles, probably many technically infringing, as do most of my peers, I have never before yesterday received any pushback or heard that anyone has. It's so shocking, and especially shocking that it would come from the APA, which is supposed to be a nonprofit and professional society advancing science, rather than the more cavalier for-profit publishers. It seems profoundly anti-science. So, just two days later, quote, after a deluge of protests from researchers who received notices from the APA to remove papers from their websites, the publisher announced it will shift its focus to commercial sites. Earlier this week, researchers took to Twitter to lament the takedown notices they had received from the APA. One posted the letter in place of his paper. The, letter were, the letters were part of a pilot program by the APA to remove unauthorized online postings of APA journal articles. 
The spokesperson told us the APA doesn't plan to send any more letters to academic websites, quote, at this time, unquote. But the publisher is still discussing whether to rescind takedown notices academic sites have already received. So piracy and Sci-Hub. I just really love this logo. I didn't want to clutter anything else on the screen with it. So just, I love Corvids, and this is just great. So if you're not aware, Sci-Hub is one of the most discussed and researched of the shadow libraries on the web right now. It has previously been sued by Elsevier, and after immediately reappearing on another server, is now being sued again. Uh, there's more than enough out there to read about, including my upcoming chapter in the ACRO book about library values and emerging technologies, uh, where I summarize some of these things that will be happening and some of the uh, aspects that go into how this is a symptom of academic publishing. Uh, one article that talks about SciHub as a symptom, I'm just going to read a few quotes from. Providing free access to scholarly journals archived behind a paywall infringes upon copyright laws. At first glance, then, the problem with SciHub seems to be its illegality. However, not everyone seems to agree with this view. While some librarians agree that the website's activities are probably illegal and definitely contract violating, many of them do not consider such activities as necessarily unethical or even revolutionary as the website itself portrays them to be. Instead, they regard SciHub and other similar projects such as LibGen as yet another initiative compelling them to diverge their attention from maximizing access to information to enforcing copyright laws. Surprisingly, scholars and librarians rarely appear to claim that SciHub is a mass piracy criminal enterprise trying to be the WikiLeaks of scientific information or the pirate bay of research, as other pundits often claim. Yet such claims appear to be at the core of the debate over the website. Uh, Elsevier is taking SciHub and Libgen to court again, apparently unaware of all the free press this got them the last time, and unaffair of, unaware of the Streisand effect. Uh, this is uh, Alexandra Elbakian, who created SciHub, and this was her response. SciHub will work as before. If there are problems with domain names, users will be able to use Tor, and then the SciHub link, the SciHub onion link. And Alexandra Elbakian, master of the smooth interview promo. So some conclusions or solutions. What would it look like if we were to have Creative Commons attribution for all scholarly uh, papers? So in academic publishing, we have the economics of prestige, where we are pushed to publish in highly prestigious journals that are almost always paywalled. Very few of the most prestigious uh, journals are open access versus the economics of plenty, meaning that making these copies and distributing them is approaching a near zero cost. So I'm going to go through a brief history of academic copyright just to come to a, a final point. The earliest copyright or author's rights laws in the 18th century, such as the Statute of Anne, 1710, and later French Republic laws were explicitly created for artistic works. They were typical monopolistic laws that protected the interests of cultural industries. Other industries, such as newspapers, relied on the free sharing and reprinting of materials. Scientific and intellectual journals worked on the same assumption. Copies could be made without the author's knowledge or consent being necessary as a means to maximize the scope of the readership. Long quotation was also necessary to preserve the intent of the author. Between 1852 and 1908, there existed a period of open licensing between France and England. All newspapers and periodicals could be printed and translated freely. And this is actually um, an image of a pirate uh, journal um, making unauthorized uh, copies of, uh, I believe, newspapers that fell under some sort of protection. So in 1908, you have the Berlin Congress uh, to amend the Berne Convention, which is what shapes international copyright law today. The Berne Congress removed the exemption for periodicals, leaving only newspapers as exempt. However, scholarly journals continued to perpetuate themselves with few restrictions. Informal arrangements for copying remained the norm through the first half of the 20th century. The post-war period saw massive subsidies from the, from, for the research fields and promoted the dissemination of knowledge as cheaply as possible. 
The scientific societies and small publishers gave way to publications by public institutions, thus making their content technically an intellectual property, but also a public good that depended on subsidies from the government. As subsidies declined after the post-war boom, there were two major economic forces that increased the enforcement of copyright. First was the need for an economic monopoly over copying rights due to reduced subsidies. The second was a change in economic model of journal publishing in which companies began to control large bundles of journals and created artificial scarcity. Companies like Elsevier struggled at first, but eventually gained a monopoly on a highly specialized literature that could not survive on its own meager re readership. The combination of this monopoly coupled with the editorial model of intellectual property control is what cemented large publishing companies' control over scholarly publication and reproduction. It's not until the rise of the internet when copying costs moved toward zero that academic publishing began to push back against this model and reassert its editorial control via the open access movement. So the future of the exhaustion principle. We have the re-digi case and digital exhaustion. So re-digi case involves a thorny copyright question of the digital age. Uh, quoting from a publisher's week, weekly story, which uh, you can find the link to in the notes when I send them out. Thorny copyright question for the digital age, should consumers have the right to resell their lawfully acquired digital media, as they are entitled to do with physical media, under a section of the Copyright Act known as the Doctrine of First Sale? In a 2013 ruling, federal judge Richard Sullivan said no, concluding that first sale defense is limited to material items like records, that the copyright owner put into stream of commerce. The case has been closely watched by the publishing industry as ReDigi and other players, including Amazon, have expressed interest in creating a resale market for eBooks. In an amicus brief filed earlier this month, the Association of American Publishers urged the court to uphold Sullivan's decision. AAP argues that legalizing services like ReDigi would be catastrophic for the publishing industry as it would enable a secondary market for cheaper yet indistinguishable used eBooks to swamp the industry's primary market. And I should note here that there's nothing in copyright law that says copyright exists to secure a market as a for the benefit of a company's profits, but it is a surprisingly common argument and you will see it crop up now and again. So H.R. 1695, Register of Copyright Selection and Accountability Act of 2017. This is the bill that will remove the Copyright Office from the Library of Congress and move it to a presidential appointee as an independent, um, independent agency with a presidential appointee. Rather than being appointed by the current Librarian of Congress, uh, as has been for um, at least, uh, I can't remember how long the Copyright Office has been there, but it's quite a long time. So the bill sailed through Congress with bipartisan support on April 26th. The first full article length response I found, and I was waiting day after day, from librarians wasn't until May 18th. The head of the Copyright Office will be a presidential nominee, not appointed or overseen by the Librarian of Congress. So in short, we come to the age old question, what is to be done? I always try to leave a topic with something concrete and that's pretty difficult to do when we talk about copyright. However, right now we have an advocate in the game, Dr. Carla Hayden, who is the librarian of Congress and any support we can give to the work she's doing in modernizing and retaining control over the copyright office, we should consider giving in order to retain an advocate for the public's rights and access to information before the office becomes yet another revolving door for industry advocates. I would also encourage you to ally ourselves with creators. Talk to your colleagues who might disagree with you on copyright. Artists, musicians, and other creators might decide to throw their lot in with copyright holders rather than see themselves as primarily members of the public who are beneficiaries of robust fair use protections. Uh, another idea, uh, another concrete uh, point would be to keep reading. Um, this presentation came out of the continuing news stories that clogged my feed after my chapter for the ACRL was done. 
The story keeps changing day after day, and I would encourage you to go through these slides and look at a few of the sources and start keeping an eye out for new developments that might affect you or your colleagues' work. The books I've mentioned in this talk, The End of Ownership and The Inevitable, are good next steps if that's what, uh, one direction you would like to go in. So my personal website periodically does an update on library issues that tend to sway heavily towards copyright news and policies. That's at the bottom. I've added on this last page an anonymous survey. Um, if Essentially, I want to know if anyone would be interested in another talk on copyright, on something more specific. Like I said, this was going to be a jaunt through some issues. These are issues that are messy. They cover a lot of different areas, and it's not always clear how they're going to apply to us. And so if this has been instructive in taking some of the, the news out there about copyright and bringing it home to you as a practitioner, as a professional, um, please let me know. And that would be something I could think about developing a, a more selective talk. Um, slides are available here. And the extended notes are available here. And I'll be able to send out the, uh, the link to the slides as soon as we're done here. And this whole slideshow is licensed under Creative Commons, so if there's any part of it you'd like to reuse in a libguide or a presentation or anything like that, please feel free. It's CC by share alike. And that'll be it for me. I wanted to leave some time for questions.